Um, turn to Exodus chapter 20. If you've been here, you know that we're in the midst of a series on the Ten Commandments, and it has been uh, just incredible. I've taught the Ten Commandments. I've never preached a series on the Ten Commandments, and every one of these commands, um, you know, you kind of get underneath them, and you realize this is a whole series of messages, and so today we're going to talk about the Fourth Commandment, and in it, He calls, he calls us to remember observe but to remember something we've been we've been remembering today you've caught this kind of theme we're just reminding each other remembering uh who he is and and what he's done uh, john locke was a a great philosopher out of the 1600s he was an uh, an english philosopher and uh physician and theologian uh he had a personal Um, identity theory that became popular where he said that memory really is the core of who you are. It makes makes you who you are. You know, we have a lot of um, personality, uh, you know, inventories and all this kind of stuff these days. Uh, Locke was arguing that without memory, then you're not who you are. If you were to take my brain and put it into you and your body or even my memory uh, and put it in your your brain, you would no longer be you. You'd be me. I mean, you might look like you you have a body, same body, but you would be me because of my, my life has been shaped by all my experiences. I think this is why it's so difficult when someone comes down with you know, dementia or has a hard time remembering things, uh, maybe loses memory, and we say things like they're no longer themselves, right? Um, now, am I the only one that every now and then I, I have a little lapse in memory? Anybody? Um, I mean, about one time out of five in the mornings, I go out to get in my car to come to work, and and um, and uh, I have a forerunner. I, I you know got the fob, you already push the button, and I like nothing. I'm like, oh yeah, I got. I don't have my keys. I have no keys. I can't go. They're in the, on the shelf right by the door that goes out to my car, and and I'm like, okay, how did I forget that, right? Um, I was encouraged when I read some stuff this week that uh, memory lapse is not uh, tied to age always. Um, children forget things, right? Young people forget things. And, and there's all kinds of people who will tell you how to remember things. Some of y'all saw maybe um, an episode of The Office where Michael Scott is giving a little pep talk to his staff. And he's teaching them what's called mnemonic devices, Right. Mnemonic devices where you you learn people's names, you know, you got little cues. And so he's telling them uh, that, you know, and he's so awkward and 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 inappropriate. And and so he he says, and I'm going to teach you all how I do this. And so I have names, I have words for each one of you. all He says, everybody know I know every one of your names. He says, all right, for instance, um, mole boy, um, no, mole face, um, um, tired eyes, um, baldy, uh, Black woman. Um, I mean, he just, you know, like, oh, you didn't just say that, right? And, and, and he says, oh, for instance, baldy. Okay, so, so you're bald. Um, your head is shiny. It's like a mirror. Mirror, M, your name's Mark. <laughs> you, you know, it's like, okay. And one of the gals says, okay, this meeting's done. I'm out. You know, she just wants to leave. But we do all kinds of things to try to remember. What's interesting, a lot of you, some of your visual learners like me, if I've met you, I can just about promise you, I will remember you. I'll remember your fate. May not remember your name. I'm going to work hard on the name. But if Stacy's with me, we got it covered. I mean, like, we, I got names, I got face. If I met you in my life, I'll remember your face. I mean, it's a crazy thing. And, and some of you have great memory, some of you can't remember much of anything. But it's true, our memories, uh, you know, really make us who we are. Memory is so important, and, and it's a big part of who we are. People have asked me, do you think we remember things in heaven? I think so. I think yes, or you wouldn't be you. I think that is true. Um, I think our personal identity is wrapped up in so many ways in our memory, and we certainly have a spiritual memory. And uh, in fact, 148 times in the Bible, God, knowing our propensity towards forgetfulness, he says, remember, remember. Remember, just a few examples before we get to the big remember today. In Deuteronomy 6, 12, he says, take care or take heed, be careful, focus, he says, lest you forget the Lord, the one who brought you out of Egypt, the one who's rescued you out of the house of slavery. He says in Isaiah 46, uh, verse 9, remember the former things of old, for I am God, and there's no other like me. I am God, there's none like me. In Psalm 119, 55, David says this. 
He says, I remember your name in the night. We sang about it a moment ago. When we're anxious, we remember his love for us. He says, oh, Lord, I will keep your law. And in Psalm 77, verse 11, he says, I will remember the deeds of the Lord. Yes, I will remember your wonders of old. So throughout Scripture, we remember, and most often it's remember who he is, how awesome he is, remember his character, and remember what he's done. Jesus then says, uh, on the night before he's crucified, he says to his disciples, and his, and his words echo forth into the church throughout all of history, he says, when you gather, remember. You know, when you come together, when you take the Lord's Supper, you remember in a very real, tactile kind of way. You, you actually eat and you drink. You take my body. This is the bread broken, my body broken for you, and, and the blood shed for you. Remember, remember, remember the cross. He knows we're, we're prone to forget. And so in, in, in Exodus 20, verse 8, we get to the fourth commandment that says, remember the Sabbath. Now, clearly that remember is observe. Don't forget this. Do this. And the word Sabbath is Shabbat in the, in the Hebrew. And the word means stop. It means rest, literally. It doesn't mean seventh. It means stop. And so you could say it this way, literally. Remember rest day. <laughs> remember stop day. Remember cease day. To keep it holy. That's to say set it apart from all other days. And, and he's, he's giving his people, look at this, he institutes a rhythmic weekly pattern in their lives. And immediately, if you're, if you're tracking with me here, you're thinking, well, Jeff, we're no longer under the law, we're under the grace. I mean, we're under grace, right? I mean, we're not, we don't keep the law, and even that was Saturday, Sabbath. Our Sabbath, worship, day of worship, focus on God has shifted to Sunday, because why? We're remembering the resurrection. Even the course of history, it's interesting, there's this thread of worship that, bam, takes a different direction right around 33 A.D. Because we started to worship on the day of the resurrection, celebrating Christ and what he has done for us, right? So every week we gather a day of remembrance. He says, six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day of the Sabbath to the Lord your God. On it you shall not do any work. Look at this. You or your son or your daughter. He's saying, hey, teach everybody. Your male servant, female servant, your livestock. No, your animals aren't going to work. A sojourner, even someone who comes in within the gates, who visits you, who comes in, you bring them into this. You're not going to work. No one's going to work. For, for in six days he ties it to creation. The Lord made heaven and earth, the sea and all that is in them, and rested on the seventh. He too stopped. Therefore, the Lord blessed the Sabbath day because he did it himself and made it holy. He, he, he put it aside. He, he separated it from all other days. It's a day that we stop to remember. And so what I want to talk about is what is this discipline of remembrance and what are we to remember? All right. Think about questions like this. And we've talked about the Sabbath recently. So uh, we have another sermon that really has a lot of pragmatic pieces to it. If you want to go back, about a month ago, in fact, where we talked about this thing of rest. What's next? We talked about rest and what it looks like in our culture. We're going to jump on that a bit more today. What, is it, what does it mean for us to use our time in a way that shows and reveals that we believe in the one who supplies all things for us? How does, how does rest express our trust in God? Why do we have such a hard time resting? Why is it that we can't just pause and do nothing? What is this discipline of remembrance? Well, first of all, I want you to see, remember who he is. If you take notes here, i got five points I want to make here uh, that teach us what to remember. He says the Sabbath is primarily meant for fellowship with God. Now, don't miss this. I mean, it, you know, a lot of people, it's Sunday. It's a day of rest. I'm going to the lake. Uh, okay. Hey, lake's cool. Awesome. Uh, it's Sunday. I'm just going to sleep in today. Be off. No, no, no. Today is a day where we pause. As believers, we stop to remember who he is. We're intentional about that, right? It's this time to stop. But the focus is on him, not simply to stop. But we gather then. To say, we are satisfied with our work this week. Together, we're satisfied with what we've done. And we're not going to follow after our simple impulses to keep on working because I'm the captain of my soul. I'm the one running the show. I'll keep on working and making sure it's happening. Instead, we stop, we step back, and together we do this. I can tell you just a moment ago, just singing, 
I do this every now and then. I was just like, man, I'm shouting it out. I'm just singing. I'm like, man, I'm about to lose my voice. You know, I'm like, oh, I got to preach. You know, this is awesome. And so I'm, I'm, I'm down there just singing, just thinking, well, how great it is to be together with you today, to be with other believers who are singing these same truths. I'm not alone in this. And man, I need to be reminded on a regular basis. I need to be reminded daily, but praise God for the gathering. That weekly we get to remind each other. It's why, why we sing together. Some days we come in here, you may not feel like singing these truths. Or you might even, even today, I'm not even sure I believe this. Or I've had a horrible week this week. But you're reminded, oh yes, yes, wait, that's who I am. Oh, wait, 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 this is true. This is true, it's true about me. I'm desperate for you. I'm, I'm in, I'm, I, Lord, I need you, we sang, right? I need, yes, I, I forgot that. I thought I was on my own here. I have him. And we hear other voices. And when you come here on certain days, and we'll all have them. I mean, your pastor will have them. I'll be down here on certain days going, God, I'm just, I'm just trying to make it through one more day. Man, I've had a rough week. And you're singing over me. Your singing helps you know, breathe life into me. And I'm like, yes, others can have faith for me. I'm starting to believe this now. You know, this is why our gatherings are so important. We remember who he is. And remember what he's done. Secondly, look at this. Remember what you are. Here's the point. Uh, you're, you're not the creator. You're the created. You have limitations. We've talked about what I, what I wrestle with often is this arrogance of capacity. Uh, that, that is, I can do this. You know, I look at a schedule. I got a 9, and then I got a 10 o'clock point. I can do that. And then I'm going to go to this. I got this. I can do that. Look at it on paper. I got this. You know, but then I realized, man, I have, I've done way too much. I'm, I'm overestimating what I think I can do. So the first thing is remember who he is. The Sabbath day is, is a day of purposeful rest. All right. Secondly, remember what you are. The, the Sabbath is a day of physical rest. Okay, so we've, we've talked about that a bit. But you've got, here's the irony. I don't know if it's so ironic, but the way to enter into rest is by, watch this, resting. All right. That's how you do it. See, the Lord wants us to rest in him. But the only way to do that, he says, is stop, stop, cease, cease driving, stop working, stop. And for those of us who have a hard time doing that, can get underneath that. There's something else going on in your heart. That's a prideful way to live, to think if I don't stop, the world will stop spinning on its axis. You're not God. You're the created and you have limitations. All right. So we're to stop and remember his work and our ultimate, you know, kind of need and, and, and our limitations. And thirdly, look at this. So remember whose you are. This is interesting. When you look at the, the command here, uh, the Sabbath was and is a mark of holiness. He says this is going to mark you. In fact, in Exodus 31, look at what it says. Um, not too far off from chapter 20, he says, And the Lord said to Moses, You are to speak to the people of Israel and say, again, Above all, how about that? Above all, you shall keep my Sabbaths, for this is a sign between me and you throughout your generations, that you may know that I, the Lord, sanctify you. Look at this. The Sabbath set them apart. I don't know if you've ever thought about this. Their, their, their rest was a, was a peculiar Unique kind of rest. This rhythm was unique to God's people. They find themselves, not unlike Israel, finds itself among other nations that do not worship their God. And so they find themselves in this land, right? He's pulled them out of Egypt. Now, where are we going? We're heading to the promised land. They're going to land there, and you guys are going to be distinct. And one of the distinctive things about you is this pattern of rest, weekly concentration on your God, remembering who he is and what he's done, and you're going to worship him and you're going to focus on him. Same is true in our day. See, what, what you might be thinking, man, I'm the only person in my apartment complex goes to church on Sunday morning. Yes, you're peculiar. You might think, well, man, wherever you, you know, wherever you, it depends on where you might live, but I'm the only person on my street, I think, that goes to, goes to church on Sunday morning. I'm getting up, I'm going to church. Yes, you're distinct. You're weird. Can I say it? You're weird for him because you have committed yourself to him. And, and I'm, I'm preaching to the choir. But listen, parents in particular who have your children here, you bring your kids to, to worship. You know, you might say, man, I, you know, fewer and fewer people doing that or nobody else in my family does. Yes, you're weird. 
You're peculiar. You're unique because you're set apart. You're different. Because God's called you to worship Him every, every week. He says, now come together. Come on, don't neglect this gathering. And again, I, I know that you're in right here, right now. You're saying, man, I'm so glad I'm here. I have been reminded of so much, more than you even know. And your children, watch this, have been reminded more than you know in our singing and all that's happening. We've been reminded of who we really are because we're prone to forget. Sabbath rest is a sign. It marks us. It's like a wedding ring. It's an outward uh, symbol of an inward commitment. You know, people might say, well, Jim, it's just a ring. I mean, you know, that's not the real deal. It's just, no, this is not just a ring. This is a wedding ring. Thank you very much. This ring means I'm committed to a woman that I said yes to, and I'm devoted to her for life. It's not just a ring. This is not just a gathering. It's a symbol. It marks us. But it is the moment where we come together and we remember we are separated. We are different from the rest of the culture. And we do it, and and, and it's a constant reminder that we don't live like the rest of the world. See how powerful this is? Just in the act of coming together. You know, some of y'all remember the story of um, Eric Little. Uh, who ran, he was the flying Scotsman. He was the fastest man alive in the early 1920s. And he ran in, in Paris, France in um, 1924 in the Olympics. And uh, his story, true story, is made popular through the film. Some of y'all, anybody see Chariots of Fire? Um, years ago, this movie came out and uh, put together by non-believers, by the way. And it's all about this guy's devotion to Christ. And what Eric Little does, because back in the day, it was still this way, back in the 1920s. Think about this. Uh, just 100 years ago. Uh, he, he had a heat. He was running the 100 meter. It was his race. Uh, nobody could beat him in the 100 meter. He was, he was a favorite to win the race, to win the gold. And, and he had a heat leading up to that, that final that was on a Sunday, and he chose not to run. He said, I'm not going to run. And, you know, and we might, even nowadays, we're like, what? That's, you're not under law, bro. You're under grace. Run. But for him, it was a devotion to Christ and to his word and to being a believer. And so his, 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 his refusal to run became an international story, really. And he chose not to run. Instead, he was going to run the 400. I mean, he could run the 400 because that wasn't on a Sunday. So he ends up running the 400. But there's a sub-story, a, a subplot to the true story. A guy named Harold Abrahams, who's a Jew, ironically, who's running against him. And Abrahams, he sees uh, Eric Little. They get to know each other. They become friends. And, and he sees that he's so content with who he is in Christ. He's so uh, at ease and at peace about that that he chooses to give up the very thing that Abrahams and, and Little and all the others are giving their lives to, to run and win the gold. And it's making Abrahams crazy. He can't understand why he would be so content when he can't find any personal peace in his life at all. And so Abraham's is there with his trainer, and he and he says this. He said, and now in one hour's time, I'll be out there again. And I will raise my eyes and I'll look down that corridor four feet wide with only 10 seconds to justify my existence. His whole life was being a runner. That was his core identity. And it wasn't Eric Little's. He was defined by something else. How about this? By someone else. It wasn't running. Though he believed that God created him to run. But he believed even more so that he created him to live to the glory of God. Eric Little went on to be a great missionary in China. In fact, died really a martyr's death in China. Incredible man, devoted to God. But he was defined by Christ. His worth was not found in running. And listen, for you, it may not be a 10-second race, but it's something. Where you're prone to run and to find your worth and your value in, maybe it's your work. Maybe, watch this, it's not your 9 to 5. This is what Sabbath is all about. Particularly for us men who tend to, Uh, define ourselves by our work, by success, whatever that might look like. But women, too, by, you know, by the approval of certain others or by your performance in some certain area of your life. You got to be super mom or you got to look a certain way, the latest fashions, whatever your pursuit is. and, and, And you're prone to find your identity or worth in that. 
The Lord says it's not going to be your nine to five that defines you. It's not a 10 second race. In fact, it's six hours one Friday. When Christ found himself on a cross, he gave his heart, his life to you. And literally gave his life on the cross. Having, watch this, run the race for you already. He lived the perfect life on your behalf. He died on the cross to take on your punishment for your sin because you could not live a holy life. You couldn't live the perfect life before a holy God. Christ does it for you. And then he dies on the cross. He's buried. He dies a death that we couldn't die. So we wouldn't have to die. Then he's raised again. So now you've been completely forgiven, totally loved, fully accepted by a holy God because of Christ. That's your identity. That's who you are. And every time we gather, Carrie noted it earlier, it's a gospel remembrance. Remember who you are. In my role, whatever I'm preaching, I told someone last night, I got one message. That's all I got. I got nothing else. I've got the grace of God. And his, his love for you and that you and I are found in him. And we're defined by him, not by our job, not by anything else in the world. The truest thing about you is that you are God's beloved son or daughter. If you've received his grace by faith. If you have not, that is not true about you. No wonder you keep running. And you'll never be content. You'll never have peace in this life until you give your life to him. So, I love what, uh, what David says in Psalm chapter 4, verse 8. He says, in peace I will both lie down and sleep. For you alone, O Lord, make me dwell in safety. If you have trouble sleeping at night, if you find yourself anxious, I want to encourage you to enter into a, a discipline, a pattern. Maybe you just need to read scripture. Maybe read a psalm you know, before you go to bed. Pray before you go to bed. I've never known anyone who has stayed up all night because they're so amazed by the love of God and the peace they have found in Christ. I guess that'd be a good thing to stay awake and think about. But most often we enter into this peaceful, soulful rest because we're reminded of who he is. So look at this Sabbath. The Sabbath is a day of soulful rest. It's a day of purposeful rest. It's a day of physical rest. It's a day of, of soulful rest. But I want you to see, fourthly, remember what he's done. Remember what he's done. It's a reminder of redemption. You've heard me say this. Uh, Deuteronomy 5.15, look at what it says. You shall remember that you were a slave in the land of Egypt, and the Lord your God brought you out from there with a mighty hand and an outstretched arm. Therefore, the Lord your God commanded you to keep the Sabbath. Look at that. Almost looks like that didn't match up. He rescued us from slavery. Therefore, keep the Sabbath. What? You know, it's a reminder. The day is to remind us of what he's done. And you and I, in the same way, have been rescued from slavery. Ephesians 1, 7 says, In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses according to the riches of his grace. I love Ephesians 2, 8, and 9. You probably know this passage. Look at this verse up here, two, two verses. Let's read these together. Watch this. Let's say this in remembrance. All right, let's do it. Ready? For by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not your own doing. It is the gift of God, not a result of works, so that no one should boast. Look at this. Not a result of works. It's not your work. That has done this. It's Jesus' work. But look at what it says. He, you've been rescued. He has saved you. He's redeemed you through, your, through his salvation that he's given to us. So the Sabbath day is a day of gospel rest. You see that? It's a day of soulful rest. It, it's a day of gospel rest. And then finally, number five, remember what's ahead. This is a beautiful thing. A hope of permanent future rest. You know, the whole book of Hebrews is about how Jesus is better. He's better than any great king. He's, he's better. He's the greater Moses. He's better than the Sabbath. In chapter 4, he says that he's better than the rest that we find given a day or taking a nap or just focusing in. He's better than some religious rite or even coming to church. He's better. He's better because we, we, we focus on him. And he says in Hebrews chapter 4, the writer says, For then, Joshua couldn't give him rest. And if he had, then why would God say there's another day that's coming? 
that rest is going to come. He says that, that there's come in this future rest, and it's found in Christ, but the Sabbath is a nod to a future permanent rest. That someday we will cease from our striving. Someday we'll stop from all the struggles of this life. And we'll find rest in Him. So the Sabbath is a day of hopeful rest. Today your hearts are filled with hope. For those of you who know Jesus, like me, we're filled with hope because we know that there's coming a day, Revelation 14, 13, says, and I heard a voice from heaven saying, write this, blessed are the dead who die in the Lord from now on. Blessed indeed, says the Spirit, that they may rest from their labors, for their deeds follow them. Hebrews 4, 1 says, therefore, while the promise of entering his rest still stands, let us fear lest any of us should fail to reach it. Friends, listen, the rest is available for us but it's possible for us to miss it. See, the Sabbath is another practice. It's, it's a shadow in the, theological terms. We call it, It's a type. It's a foreshadowing of something else to come. It's a foreshadowing of someone. In Colossians 2.17, Paul says, these are a shadow of the things to come, but the substance belongs to Christ. Ephesians 2.14, Paul says, He Himself is our peace. He is our peace. He is our rest. You see, Sabbath rest is ultimately not a day, but a person. Rest is found in Christ because He's the one and the only one who lived the perfect life for us. He's the one who went to the cross and cried out a single word in the Greek to tell us die, a cry of victory. It means it is finished. The work that's necessary for our salvation is done. The thing that matters the most, the work that most matters and defines us has been accomplished by Christ. We can rest in Him. You see, Sabbath rest is not simply a day. With all these things that we've talked about, Sabbath rest is a life. I love to say that, you know, Jesus was often busy, but he was never in a hurry. He was at such rest because he was living in the will of the Father. And friends, you and I can live that way. You can live that way. As we turn our hearts to him and we just continue to pour our hearts out to him and give him our lives and just be reminded. It's why it's been said, you need to preach the gospel to yourself every single day because that's who you are. It's why time with Him in the morning is so important. Just start your day to say, Lord, remind me again who I am. I'm prone to forget. I'm going to forget today. That's why we just put you know, Scripture in our lives and, and, and we listen to, to Christian music that reminds us of who we are. You, you, you sing songs. Maybe in your car you just listen to music. Songs that we sing here on Sunday morning. Because Jesus says He is the Lord of the Sabbath. He's the one who defines the Sabbath. He's the one who brings Sabbath rest. And he is the one who said in Matthew 11, come to me. No, look at this. He doesn't say, come to your cell phone. Come to your computer. He doesn't even say, come to a good nap. He doesn't even say, come to church. Now, we we talked about how important that is. You wouldn't be hearing this right now if you weren't here. Critical in your life is your weekly gathering with the saints. I hope I've made that clear today. He didn't say come to the, you know, come to come to tea time, come to golf, come to your next vacation. Come to me, he says. Come to me. Why? Because only in him do we find this rest. C.S. Lewis is the one who said, God cannot provide peace apart from himself, because only in him do we find it. You've got to come to him. He says, I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you. Learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy, and my burden is light. And I just want to speak to some of you here today. You've heard it, purposeful rest, physical rest, soulful rest, gospel rest, hopeful rest. But some of you here today, 
you don't have the spiritual memory to draw from. Maybe you can't remember that you've actually given your heart to Christ. Because maybe that's not real clear in your life. Maybe there hasn't been a moment where you've actually given your heart to Him. You started coming to church, maybe, at some point. But you've never come to Him. And today's your day. You know, some of you are like me. I've got a spiritual memory. I have a memory of something that happened long before I was born. Christ on a hill called Calvary. Before I I ever wept my first tears of confession before him. Of all of the faces that he saw on the cross. In the divine mind of God. He saw my face. And he knew there would be a day when I would give my heart to him. And he saw your face. And it was enough to kill him. He stayed on the cross because of. Among all the faces that he saw in his divine mind, he saw your face. Because he knew there'd be a day when you need to come to him to rest. And today, friend, for some of you, it could be today. Your first real day of rest ever in your life. When you come to Christ, there's such a burden lifted. You're no longer trying to gain God's approval. Because you realize you already have it in Christ. That's rest and hope. And he gives that to us. Augustine is the one who said, our hearts are restless until we find rest in thee. You'll never find it apart from him. So I want us to pray together. And we're going to sing together. We have time to just sing the truth yet again before we go. And watch this. Don't don't run off. Stop. Don't, Don't leave. Just pause. Rest in Him. Megan's going to sing this truth over us, and then we're going to sing. So let's all bow our heads and close our eyes. You can just stay seated for now. Just let His love wash over you right now. Be reminded of how good He is and how much He loves you. He's given us purposeful rest. He's given us physical rest, soulful rest, gospel rest. He's given you hopeful rest. Lord, we thank you for Jesus. We thank you for the cross. We thank you that you were not just our good example, but you were our substitute. You lived the perfect life for us. You did all the work that's necessary. We rest in that work. You said it's finished. So, Lord, we turn our hearts to you. We give our lives to you. Friend, if you've never received Christ and His love for you right now, you can say yes to Him. Lord Jesus, come into my heart. Make me the person you've created me to be. I give you my life. I rest in you. By faith, I receive your grace, your forgiveness.